but you know, caps, 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 caps. Caps have been in the news for the last two weeks. Now it looks like caps aren't going to come in until next year. So yeah. there's this there's this kind of two speed approach I think that's been taken. And you know, we've we've spoken about it before, and it's widely known that the government is wanting to address housing affordability, it polls well, and they're, they're, they're cracking on with it in the public domain. So I think that's what's got everyone on, on edge, is that there is this kind of massive view. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of The Quality Years. I'm coming to you from Wadjuk, Noongar country in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society, coming today from Garrigal Land, in Sydney and Dirk, what the heck just happened? I felt like life was traveling along pretty nicely there and suddenly, boom, everything got turned upside down in the last 10 days. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You, I mean, to say everything was going along nicely, I think probably the, the thing was people had a handle on what was going on more than anything else. And yeah, and you know. I think it, it probably all started last weekend, Saturday. There were a couple of big announcements from the government league yeah, sent out on a Saturday. And there's nothing quite like a Saturday announcement, as we've spoken That's about right. in the past. You know it's not going to be good when there's when, when things that drop on a Saturday. So, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's Saturday, like 10 days before budget. And yeah. uh, you're, you're talking about the International Education and Skills Strategic Framework, yep. which, which kind of got released. Was this even anticipate it? Had they announced that they were releasing this? Look, not to my knowledge. I know I can't give away sources, but you know, obviously I talk to people in different places and, and, and certainly they weren't given much of a heads up on it either. So it, it, yeah, it's definitely come as a bit of a bit of a surprise. Surprise out of left field, wasn't it? Yeah, major document. Look, it is it is slated for consultation, so that's a good thing. The crazy bit, I guess, is that in the same announcement, they're talking about putting legislation through uh, Parliament this coming week or on the next week, which will be the ESOS amendment bill. So when you see the two of them aligned, it goes back to, I guess, what we've spoken about in the past in terms of the government releasing things that doesn't seem to be a, for the want of a better word, an elongated plan where these things are systematically brought up, they're dealt with, everyone can see them coming, they're in your, your full Consult vision. On. Yeah, yeah consulted on, you know, the, but, but you can see them coming down the pike, right? Whereas I think that the difficult thing with this is, is that there's a lot of people now scrambling. A lot of people are unsure. The sector uncertainty is incredible. And, you know, to, I guess, Phil Honeywood's point, who I, I sat down with and spoke to after or while the announcements were going on and, and also after Monday, where he sat down with a number of ministers, you know, that a lot, there's still a lot of questions to be asked. So there's, the devil is, is definitely in the detail, and but the government seems to be chugging along with this idea of, of reducing net overseas migration, which, you know, again, in its own right, fair enough. But the way in which they're going about it, I think, is now really biting on a, on a, on a number of fronts. Yeah, and look, before we get into the details of it, I just did want to just ask you about that because this government, to, to, to give them credit, in other policy areas, they seem to have been really quite meticulous. You know, they've been flagging issues in public. They've mm. been shuffling it off to Senate committees, putting it out for consultation. Reports have been coming back. They've been taking up recommendations and moving forward. Like, yep. as a sort of, you know, politically neutral kind of person, I feel like this government's been doing a relatively good job in most areas of, of making that whole process quite transparent. But it feels like this is just completely the opposite. We've been sort of handing handed reports out of the blue, announcements being made without necessarily a lot of consultation. I don't know. Is that just my interpretation or is there something else going on? Oh, look, I, the bottom line is I think it could be done better. There's, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, look, I think you're right. And I think, you, you know, you... What you've just said certainly resonates with with a lot of the people that I'm talking with uh, across the sector. Mm -hmm. Again, it's it's you know one minute talking about, and we'll, we'll get into the detail. But you know, a great example of this, and we'll, we'll come to it. But you know, caps, 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 caps have been in the news for the last two weeks. Now it looks like caps aren't going to come in until next year. So yeah. there's this there's this kind of two speed approach I think that's been taken and. You know, we've, we've spoken about it before and it's widely known that the government is wanting to address housing affordability. It polls well and they're, they're, they're cracking on with it in the public domain. So I think that's what's got everyone on, on edge is that there is this kind of massive view and, and the rhetoric isn't subdued either. It's, it's very pointed in terms of the way that, that the ministers are speaking about these things and, you know, you know bringing the sector under control will 
did it really need being put, you know, being brought under control? The sector was going quite well, and you can see by the growth numbers and, and by student outcomes, you know, most of the metrics, well, 95% of the metrics are all really, really positive around international students. It's the bit around housing affordability, and there's this perception that exists in, in the electorate that international students and, and net overseas migration is driving the, the housing crisis. And as we've spoken about, there's been a number of reports. The GO8 put a, a piece out, you know, around structural kind of issues. The Property Council have, have, yeah, the Property Council have put something out around just actually how much international students do affect the rental market. 4%. We hear... 4%. Yeah, four percent. You know, I saw Mark Scott on the ABC. Phil Honeywood was on breakfast the other day. You know, reaffirming these points, and it, they just seem to be falling on deaf ears with the government. They absolutely seem to think that international students. And I would say, you know, Frank Kelly, I think, who interviewed Phil Honeywood, said, you know, would you not say that international students contribute? Well, yes, of course they're contributing to the housing crisis, but when you look at the statistics. They're contributing in a very minimal way compared to other cohorts that are around. So there is this kind of view more widely that, that the international education sector is being targeted unfairly in this sense, that the government hasn't really got its scope set on the on the target uh, as well as what it could. And then the second bit around that is around the implementation. And some of the policies, and, and again, we'll get into those, are really bringing with the, the targeted outcome is is bringing with a number of really reputable providers who are really struggling in the market now. Whereas some of these policies should be more targeted, should be more scalpel-like at the lower end of the market, but they just seem to be, you know, sweeping uh, the entire sector. And, and that's really, it's really disappointing. So my last comment before we, we do jump into those details is actually my observation around, around Mark Scott, who's been in the media quite a lot over the last... Mm week and, and just the observation that he's such a great spokesperson. He's obviously ch- uh, vice chancellor of University of Sydney and the current chair of the group of eight institutions, but just a very sensible policy voice. And he was yeah. pointing to statistics around how when COVID happened and there were no international students in Australia, that was one of the times when rents started going through the roof. So yeah. he's just very sensibly pointing to all of this data. And I think that kind of influential voice, he's obviously been chair of the ABC. He's mm-hmm. been in many influential positions, has a has a hotline through to a lot of people in the government. I'm just hoping that voice will, will cut through. But let's get into some of these details since we've been promising yep. it. Do you want to start with the, the Saturday announcement? Is that the uh, best place for us to start? Okay, so let's get down into some of those details that we've been promising, Dirk. What, what do you think is the, the biggest issue that's, that's at play here? Yeah, I was, look, it's a, mate, there's a few of them, but yeah, probably look the biggest one that's been in the media is is obviously caps. So you know this is is driving everyone bonkers at the moment in terms of the government coming out and saying they want to cap international students. Again, I mean we've spoken about this. I've written about it on a number of occasions. Times Higher Ed picked it up the other day, and I and I think it's gonna gonna go a little bit further. We have a capping system in place already, and it's it's the Crocos Register. What I, well, what perplexes me about this notion of capping students is that there's almost a second cap that's going to be brought into play. So every education provider that can supply education services to international students needs to be registered on the CRICOS register, which is the Commonwealth register for whatever it is. It, it evades me. But with that, they have to nominate a certain amount of people that they can have on their campus. So that cap is in place. I mean, there's a system there. So... The, the logical point would be, rather than the government going to the media and saying, we're going to cap, we're going to bring in all this new legislation, we're going to do all these things, is to just sit down and look at the Crocos Register and say, where, where can we make, where can we, we bring down allocations? At the moment, and I think I, I've mentioned this prior, I think that the cap currently sits at about 1.5 million. If you take into account all of the Crocos Register providers and their upper limits, and there's a story on the Koala News that I wrote probably about a month ago on this one, and I listed out universities, I listed out the share by university groupings. So the group of eight is actually the, the, the largest group of universities in terms of cap allocations within the Crocos register. But yeah, it gives this notion. So certainly in the Saturday announcement, again, it was flagged caps, no real detail on it though. And I think what will end up happening is, uh, and certainly what I've heard is the legislation that will be introduced will give the minister greater powers to adjust caps or to be able to do that. And it seems like through discussions and, and again, post Phil Honeywood's chat with the ministers, it would seem that those caps now will will probably be held off until next year. As part of the capping arrangements, it appears that the government wants to sit down with every Krakos provider and have a discussion with them about 
how many students on campus, what the allocations are by course, to start look linking those courses more to jobs and skills outcomes and make them massive conversations to have with each and everything. And it takes into account a number of assumptions. So we know that generally somewhere between one and two out of 10 international students will remain in the country as permanent residents. Between eight and nine of them will return home. So we're not talking about permanent migration or, or well, certainly the government's maybe talking about permanent migration and, and moving people who come to study here into skilled areas in Australia. But mate, there's eight out of you know, 80%, 85% of students return home. So what they're doing is looking at students holistically. And again, it's a very blunt kind of view where, where those students who choose to come to Australia to study a degree, it could be a master's degree, it could be a bachelor's degree, it could be a vet qualification, and they return to their home country to use those skills you know, in their own life, in their own country. And it's very much, you know, for the want of a better word, a transaction. They're coming here to study and then returning. 80% of the market they're missing with this conversation. It's a very strange and perplexing view that they're trying to link, you know, or, or trying to, to garner, I guess, more and more tied to the jobs and skills framework as opposed to looking at a market, as opposed to saying, you know what, 15, 20% of students actually want to stay on. Let's let's have a have a conversation about how we get those fifteen to twenty students into the right jobs, or fifteen to twenty percent of students into the right jobs that that do support our economy. But you know what? We acknowledge there's a marketplace here, and you know Australian universities compete with Canadian universities, UK universities, US institutions for those globally mobile students who are looking to upskill themselves and uh, possess a, a mobile qualification that allows them to work globally, not look at, at migrating to Australia. So. Again, it's 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 an issue that's just fraught with so many questions, so many rabbit holes that you end up going down. But it yeah. seems like the base premise isn't quite right in starting the discussion. So interesting, I read a, a very good piece from Andrew Norton, high, higher education specialist, policy analyst, and, and what have you, very, very well regarded. He was writing on LinkedIn earlier this week. And essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically saying this is an incredibly bad idea. And... Mm -hmm. It, it has some precedent, at least in the dis domestic sphere, when the Abbott government back in 2013, 2014, decided to introduce similar pricing signals on fees for domestic students and right. trying to push... Incentivise students, programs, yeah. Incentivise people to do certain degree programs by changing changing the price signals. And CAPS is, is a similar sort of concept. Like, oh, if we cap business programs, then suddenly students are going to go off and do health degrees. But in fact, the evidence back from the uh, sort of 2014 changes in the domestic space show that students don't care. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I, if, if you want to be studying business, you're going to go study business and yep. move into business. You're not necessarily going to change your entire perspective of your future, suddenly overcome your fear of blood and become a nurse. I mean, it's just not reality, except yeah. for that small proportion that you're talking about who might be on that migration pathway who who may go into one of those disciplines, but that's a completely different equation to simply hoping to put something in place that's going to miraculously drive students to something that they don't want to do. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And look, beyond that, I think, you know, we know as, as human beings, you know, and the evidence certainly in, in probably, if I can say Western countries is probably more evident. If you're doing what you're loving, you're going to be better at it. You're going to love what you're doing. You're going to stick to it and you're going to, and you, you know, the, the the whole track of this is is so much better, and that's what we teach our kids. You know, do do something that you love because you if love. you do something you you love, you're not going to work a day in your life. And it? and it's that's the that's the bit that seems to be missing out of all of this. So I think I think you're absolutely right, Rob. It's the evidence stacks up that this is a conversation that that isn't necessarily a good one. Again, when we when we think about, I mean, just in terms of going back to the the, the capping, imagine being in the Department of Education now and having a minister signal that the department's going to have to have a conversation with every single registered provider around this before the 1st of January. I mean, there's going to be some very, very busy people in the department at the moment. Now, whether that yeah. conversation is an email, whether that conversation is looking at a database and saying we're, you know, randomly going to do this to your course profile, again, you know, for universities, that's, you know, that's, that's big deal, but to private colleges and to, again, we're not talking about the bottom 35, which got sent letters last week, where we're talking about the majority of private enterprises that, that teach, you know, voc ed or higher ed. This is big, a really big deal, a really, really big deal. So 
it let's see how it, let's see how it drops, mate. And I think you know that's I think on on every single issue where we're going to end up in that same in that same outcome is let's just see how this drops because there's still a lot of unanswered questions before a lot of these things can be done. Yeah, look, it may it may end up being that this is just a political move to sort of try and diffuse some of the public sentiment and that maybe yeah. we get to the 1st of January and it gets pushed back and ignored and overlooked. This this happens all the time. De- devil will be in the detail. A couple, couple of bits of in- uh, sources of information for people to go looking if they want to look up more. Obviously, Koala News, I mean, you, you, you were ahead of this a month ago. You're already writing about this and, you know, and pointing out the sort of cry cost caps and, and the like. So obviously... Lots of good articles up there at the moment. And then also, I'd, I'd, I'd give a shout out to Andrew Norton, andrewnorton.net.au. Some really good uh, analysis up, up up there as well. Yep. But more issues to unpack in this as well. Yep. So the ESOS Amendment Bill uh, was signalled in that Saturday announcement. So as as we mentioned earlier, the legislation is going to be presented to Parliament, uh, I believe, this week or early next week uh, to amend the ESOS Bill. Again, haven't seen a draft. So it's kind of like pinning the tail on the donkey. I mean, there's certainly a few things in there that that they're flagged in terms of giving Minister Clare more jurisdiction over things. But by and large, we haven't seen the legislation. So it's when when that comes out, it's going to be really, really interesting. Being flagged about onshore commissions, onshore transfers, those types of things. So again, the devil will be in the detail when this drops. Now, obviously, there's a process around all of this. So, you know, just introduced, well, particularly in the current parliament, nothing seems to get through on the first go anymore. So Labor is going to be looking for, you know, cross-bench support or green support on this. So there might be some horse trading that goes on, depending on what the Liberal Party actually try and do. You know, if that ends up getting kicked to a kicked to a Senate committee and there might be, you know, different provisions that are, are thought to be brought into it or, or some that might be thought to be brought out of it. So again... This kind of concerns me because once you get it in policymakers' hands in Parliament, it's live and it's on the table and you don't know what's actually going to get passed until it gets passed. So let's hope there's some there's some, you know, steady hands and, and steady heads around this that what actually gets passed isn't going to be too detractive from the from the industry itself. There are some really good changes that have and very sensible changes that have already been suggested. The one that you're sort of talking about just a moment, the onshore commissions. The decoupling of institutions, owning agencies, those sort of things. Like these are these are sensible changes. Uh, right, closing are. down of providers that don't have students. I mean, all of this stuff is yeah, is absolutely. really good. But, but again, take take that issue that you just mentioned in terms of decoupling, you know, institutions from agencies. Again, no detail that we've seen. What does that mean for a company like IDP, which has you know university ownership in it? Is it a zero percent ownership, or do you have to own a certain percentage, you know, to be exempt from it? Our university is just exempt from it. It's without the detail. This is the next level, and and this is why I keep saying rabbit holes because there are yeah. there are so many rabbit holes around these sorts of things. <laughs> well, let's find ourselves another an, another rabbit hole to go down. What do you what do you want to choose next? Oh, mate, let's go to visa fees. I mean, visa fees have been in the media for what feels like since the Grattan report was released, which was, what, months ago. You know, the Grattan report, I think, suggested that visa fees should go up significantly to deter people. Again, as you mentioned, on a price point, up to 2500 from 700 I mean, it was just, it was nuts. In the in discussions that I've had with people, it seems like the government probably didn't have an appetite to put it up that much. But certainly the, the number that I keep hearing is around the 1500 mark. So to see how that falls out. Now, the interesting thing was, is that actually didn't make the budget papers. So again, one of these issues that's been in the public domain for quite some time, being allowed to, you know, gather steam, almost smoke, fire, but yet didn't appear in the budget papers. So the the story in the background is that I've heard that the government may have thought that's just one step too far at the moment, and but they're keeping it on the table and they've said that they will go up into the future. Again, when we talk about what does that mean? Well, watch this space. Let's see how it drops. When when will they be put up? And if they're not in the budget papers, then you know they could go up. You know, one January they could go up. You know, but we're speculating. We have no idea. But again, for such a large issue, such a large strategic structural issue for our sector to be, for the want of a better word, pulled at the last minute or not appear when it's been discussed about in public, again, just underlines that uncertainty that exists around around the sector at the moment. But let me diverge a little bit because one of the things that I've become a lot more aware of in the last sort of 12 months has been around investment in our sector. And so a lot of our discussions sort of talk about, you know, university recruitment, universities' budgets, private colleges this, private colleges that. 
There are a heck of a lot of investment funds that invest a significant amount of money in our sector, whether they be you know private organisations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The likes of IDP, obviously, they're shareholder driven. You know, Navitas shareholder driven. Next Dead, yeah, absolutely. Housing providers. The what? What all of the? Uh, the question I guess I have more than anything is what is all of this uncertainty doing to those investment streams and you know, portfolios that people might have that hold some of these international education or related entities within those portfolios, what's it doing to, to, to their appetite for investing in the sector? So once that starts dropping off, you know, that's going to be, or if that starts dropping off due to, let's face it, uncertainty, then where are we at then? Because that becomes a really big thing. And then where does that money, where does that investment money go? And so from a broader economy point of view, I think the government needs to be really cautious about you know, the ripples they're creating uh, across, right across the sector. Yeah, there's also the contradiction between the sector, which is trying to talk about the positive impact that mm. international students have on the framework of the country in yep. terms of the institutions, the skills that they bring to our research and all of these things and that sort of persistent narrative that international students are, quote marks, cash cows. Mm. But that kind of move, even just the talk of, of a quadrupling tripling, quadrupling of visa fees mm -hmm. just completely undermines that work that the sector is doing to try to balance out the narrative that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that's coming from the government. So that becomes self-reinforcing. So yep. yeah, it's it's dangerous, dangerous territory. Should we move on to yep. budget? Because the budget, the time we're recording on a Wednesday morning, yep. um, budget has just dropped yep. last, last night. night. Absolutely. Yep. So yeah, look, Tracy Harris did you know burn the candle at both. Yeah, great yep. piece the, this morning. So she she looked over it. Ironically, I guess there was nothing really in the budget that we didn't expect coming. As I mentioned earlier, we didn't get the run of the visa fees. What probably stood out in the budget more than anything was that commitment to reducing net overseas migration. My understanding was that the forecasts in the budget have might net migration moving from five hundred and twenty eight thousand in twenty two twenty three to two hundred and sixty thousand in. 2024, 20, 25, that's that's 50%, right? Um, over 50% drop in one year. So that's a, that's a significant, significant commitment the government's made. Furthermore, it looks like that they've put in the budget papers to even further cut out to 235 in 26, 27, and in 27, 28. So we're certainly, we're definitely looking at a, at a retractive regime or attractive kind of sector at the moment. And, and we'll see how that goes. Now, Obviously, the net overseas migration isn't all students, so it'll be interesting to see how that's cut up. But yeah, I mean, it's it's you know that being in the budget paper is it's a significant a significant announcement. It'd be interesting to see once again, as we've said a couple of times, just interesting to see how that plays out in in reality. Perhaps if this ceases to become a political issue, that just quietly gets shelved at the next election, which is about twelve months out at this at this point. So it'd be around about the time of the next budget. So depending on how things go with public opinion. Maybe that's one of those things that just quietly gets dropped. I mean, it's, it's, it's this, there's this, we say, once again, a contradiction between the government on one hand saying, oh, you know, we want to reduce numbers. <laughs> we know that most of those numbers are going to metropolitan areas, the group of eight institutions and the like, oh, we're going to somehow redirect them out to regional institutions. But in fact, we know in reality that regional institutions get hit harder than anybody when these kind of things happen. So just to simply put a red line is not going to drive change. Yeah. yeah and again, it comes back down to, you know, what we, what we keep hearing around this blunt instrument, you know, it's one size fits all. And, you know, I think we mentioned a couple of podcasts ago, but Scott Bowman, you know, in his kind of weekly musings to, to CDU really spoke about the meaning of edu international education in the territory and, and how different it is to, you know, the Sydney's and the Melbournes and, and, you know, just the, up the uptick in students, the skills needs, the all of those things are just so much different in a territory context than what they are in a in a in a city Melbourne context. One thing before we move off the budget, I want to highlight: Tracy actually picked up a really good nugget, and in the budget overview, there's a line in there that says services exports are also expected to contribute growth as the recovery in the international internet as the recovery in the number of international students and tourists continues. So there seems to be a bit of a massive well. A massive contradiction in terms of <laughs> how how that might contribute growth while cutting in over fifty percent. So, I'll leave, I'll park that like, one there and let, let the listeners work that one out for themselves. I was going to say it's a bit like saying, look, we're going. What we're going to do is we're going to try and solve 
climate change by planting a lot more trees to to draw carbon dioxide out of the oxygen uh, uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and at the same time turning around and then cutting down a forest you know across the road yeah truly truly yeah truly that's ridiculous absolutely one of the things if we move on one of the things that phil honeywood i think really kind of tried to drive home with the ministers was the role of the Council for International Education. And I think this is a really a really interesting one. It seems, again, like some of this work, or most of this work has been fairly, been done very, very linearly by the government. And Phil certainly imposed the point that the Council for International Education exists and it's got a key role in, in coordinating, you know, many of the issues that are going on at the moment and ensuring that the providers are properly consulted. I think he makes a really good point here. There needs to be an avenue where go- the government can consult, talk, bounce ideas, and, and the, the council seems to be the, a, a very good avenue to do that. So let's hope that the council does get more board papers their way and they get to kind of cut through first and second drafts of things before legislation is formed, before strategic papers are released, because I think that will add to the quality of those, but also allow for the sector then to be able to understand where the government nets heads at and in, in what direction they're moving in. Yeah, and good on Phil for right, really driving that process of mm. uh, increasing the importance of, of that council because for as many years as we can remember, there's you know there's been a feeling that the industry hasn't had a really strong hotline through to government. And yeah. so that's a, an important mechanism that, that's now in place and, and great to see Phil as our peak representative continuing to drive that narrative. Absolutely. That kind of sums up where we're at. Well, one point, probably before we go that I'd, I'd love to be able to kind of put on the table is we've spoken a little bit in the past around the importance of the business lobby and, and the import, the importance of, you know, government doesn't really, well, how do I phrase this? There's no votes in education. The education lobby, you know, struggles at times to get its message across and, and has done so ever since I've, I've been in the sector and, and in broader, more broadly in, in higher education. When the business lobby starts standing up and the business lobby start talking about their needs and their requirements, governments do tend to take a bit more notice. And so it was really, I guess, uh, wonderful, wonderful to see a gentleman called Paul Nicolau. Now, Paul, for full disclosure, Paul and I did a panel at the ISANA conference last year in December. Paul's a great guy. He heads up Business Sydney and Paul has come out in support of international students on behalf of Business Sydney. And he talks about the role that international students play in the economy in Sydney as, as well as backpackers. And to ensure that international students aren't seen as the villains in, in all of this, and that they do play a much wider role in ensuring our communities, you know, operate well. They do, obviously, as he says, they do a lot of a lot of jobs that potentially, you know, Australian domestic students, domestic people wouldn't, and that they fill a massive holes in, in casual workforces. So, as we've spoken about in the past, and certainly as we saw through COVID and the need uh, to secure uh, employment for students, this is a really a really good angle, I think, and I really hope that. Other business lobbies uh, join uh, in Business Sydney's view that the international students are really good. Yeah, a really good point. My last observation for today, also out of the budget, and this is from work done by by Liam Prince, who's the director of the Achichis Indonesia In Country Consortium, who will be joining us on the podcast next week for a deep dive on the new Colombo plan and. He's pointed out that the new Colombo plan funding has been maintained in the budget, which is great news for Australian mm-hmm. learning abroad. The new Colombo plan helps Australian university students to have an outbound study experience somewhere in the Indo-Pacific region, valued at $50 million a year. So it's a, it's a good investment by the Australian government. And Liam cites the figure that the NCP has helped increase the number of Australian students studying in the Indo-Pacific from 8,400 students in 2014 to 15,400 in 2019, so an 83% increase. So talk about an incredible Mm. soft power initiative from Australian government that's been in place now for over a decade, and great to see that even though it was introduced by the former Liberal government, it's being maintained and continues to grow under under the Labor government. So deep dive on the new Colombo plan with Liam Prince next week. So a shout out to Tracy Harris for, for the excellent article on the budget papers in the Koala News. And as always, make sure you go to thekoalanews.com, sign up for all of the latest international education news for Australia. Dirk, awesome having you on the podcast and thanks for sharing your knowledge and analysis as always. I'll uh, see you in a couple of weeks' time. Look forward to it, Rob. Thanks. Thanks, Dirk. 
Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.